Hello and welcome to this video tutorial from ComputerGarGar.com and in this video we are going to look at five different examples of the indirect function of Excel. Very much a misunderstood and extremely useful function. Now I'm going to put in the description of this video the time of each tip as well. So if you can't watch all five in one go, you can jump or skip to the one of interest to resume watching later on. Okay, let's get on with this. This first example, I've got these sales people in column A, and then I've got the sales of three different regions in B, C, and D Southampton, Liverpool, Cardiff. And what I want to do is in cell G4, I want to produce a total for the region specified in F4. Now, for anyone who may be watching this and have never used the indirect function before, its purpose is to convert a text string into a reference. So I want to refer to cell F4 and use that name as a reference for that range. Now, something that's already been done here is I have created named ranges. So if I select cell B3 to B10, you can see in the top left corner that is called Southampton. And Liverpool is called Liverpool and Cardiff is called Cardiff. And that's done simply by selecting the range of cells and by typing in a name in the top left corner there. You can look up more stuff about named ranges another time. But they've already been named. And one good use of indirect function is to be able to reference named ranges using values of a cell. So in cell G4, I could write a simple sum function and it will ask me where the numbers are, what ones do you want to sum? I want to sum whatever's typed in F4, currently Cardiff, but that may change. Now Cardiff is written as a value, a text string. I want to convert that into uh, you know, a reference. I can't just click on that cell and close bracket and enter. You won't know what I'm talking about. What I need to do in there is I need to put indirect, opening bracket, then refer to that cell, and then a closing bracket. You can see the only mandatory question is the ref text. There's another one for A1, which I've got an example of coming back shortly. It's an are you doing an A run reference? Yes, I am at the moment. Closing bracket, press enter. And now I've got the total of Cardiff sales. But if I click on cell F4 and type Liverpool, I can get Liverpool sales. Or if I type Southampton, I can get Southampton sales. So it's all based on this dynamic referencing of F4. Whatever F4 says, because I've got these named ranges, that's how it's working. So that's the first example of indirect being able to use it with named ranges. Let's move on to the next. Now, another key benefit of using indirect is being able to reference different sheets of a workbook. So what I've got here is I want to produce a total again. And once again, it's from the value of B3. But this time, I'm not using named ranges. I'm referencing different worksheets. And you can see at the bottom, I have a sheet called India, a sheet called Sweden, and a sheet called South Africa. And at the moment, you know, I want to be referencing Sweden in this example. Just having a look at these sheets, they've all got basic sales information like the previous example. They're all the exact same ranges. The values are in C4 to C11. Of this example, they happen to be the same size ranges, C4 to C11. The only thing that's different is they're on different sheets. So here we go again. It's another sum function. And once again, I'm going to need indirect. Now, this time, we're going to have to create a bit more of the, the string ourselves. We will need to concatenate different elements of it together. So the ref text is going to start with the name of the sheet, which is Sweden here, a.k.a. whatever's in B3. Then I'm going to put in an ampersand, which is to concatenate, to kind of join elements of the address together. And I'm going to open a set of inverted commas. 
and in there type an exclamation mark. Exclamation marks always follow the name of a sheet in a reference. And then I'm going to type C4 colon C11 because they are the cells that contain those numbers I'm adding on all three sheets. They're the same size ranges. I close the inverted commas and then I close bracket for indirect and close bracket for the sum function. And when I press enter, I've got the values for Sweden. And if I change Sweden to India, I get the values for India. And if I change values for South Africa, whoops, helps if I typed in the right cell. You guys could have told me there. <laughs> it doesn't work though. Um, so the reason for this, which some of you may have thought of as I approached, is that the sheet South Africa has a space in its name. And if I just demonstrate, if I type an equal sign and reference the sheet called South Africa, if I just click somewhere for a moment and press enter, that's what the reference looks like. So you see you have the sheet name, you have the exclamation mark, you have the cell references, but you also have these single quotations, these apostrophes around the sheet name. Excel only does that if there's spaces in the name of the sheet. But that's what my formula was missing. Now, even though I don't need those with India and Sweden, and I've kind of proven that by showing you that it's working, it would also do no harm if I put these in. So basically, that's what we're going to have to do. So let me go back to the formula. And before the sheet reference, I will put in my inverted commas, a single quote, single apostrophe, close in inverted commas. So that may look a little bit weird on screen, but in there I've got an apostrophe surrounded by inverted commas, double inverted commas. I then need the ampersands to join the sheet name on the end and then join the closing quote, followed by the exclamation mark, followed by the range. So I've just made sure that I've got those single quotes or apostrophes around the sheet name. Now when I press enter, it continues to work for India. It continues to work for Sweden, but it now also works for South Africa, even though that sheet name contains spaces. So that is how we can use the indirect function to reference different sheets of a book. A very powerful example of needing indirect function. Okay, now in this third example, we're going to use the indirect function for a R1C1 reference. Now, what I want to do here is get the last value of a table. So let's imagine I've got January, February, March, and that's going to expand into April, May, June. So it's an example of a table that's always growing. Now, in this example, I want to get the last value, and I mean last column. That's what I mean. But this demonstration would work equally well for last row, if that's what you're trying to do. So what I want here is in cell F3, I want to get the value from cell D10, because that is the last column, like the current month, if you will. But in time, you know, next month is going to be E, the month after it will be F, the month after it will be G, and and so on. It may even reduce in time if people change this data for future years. So I want to, you know, it's, it's expandable. It's always changing. I want my formula to grab whatever the last cell in a row or column is. So indirect is going to do that. This time I will not need the sum function or anything like that. I'm not totaling anything. I'm simply grabbing a value from a cell. So I'm going to put in indirect open bracket and you see the second question says a1 but I'll just put a comma in a moment to move into that we've got two ways of referring to a cell the a1 style which is your traditional way you know cell d3 cell d8 cell a1 and then the r1 c1 style so in a case of d10 that is row 10 column 4 that's what that is Although we see column headers like A, B, C, D, we can also reference them numerically, which really is what Excel does anyway. So it may be a little bit more difficult for us to relate to that when it comes to columns. 
Not with rows, because it does it anyway. But with columns, it's harder. You know, G is 7. But uh, there are some benefits to that, you know. So, what I want to do here is, for the first part, the ref text, I'm going to open up a string, inverted commas, and type R, which stands for 10. Uh, sorry, which stands for row, sorry, if you haven't guessed. Uh, and then 10. Sorry, so I'm after row 10. That's what I want. Uh, R1C1 referencing row 10 C, which obviously stands for column. Then I'm going to close inverted comma and ampersand to join on. Now I need to figure out what the column number is. In this example, it's four, but that's going to change. To find it, I'm going to bring in the count A function, which counts all non blank cells. I'm going to open a bracket up and I'm going to ask it to count the values of row 10. And I'm going to close bracket for count A. And I'm then going to put in a comma. So I've now answered the ref text and I'm back to the A1 optional question. Is it interpreted as an R1C1 style reference? Now I'm going to choose false this time. I do want the R1C1 style. So I can double click on that or you can just type that in. Whereas typically if you leave that blank like I did in the previous two examples, then that will just use the traditional A1 style. Close bracket for indirect, and when I press enter, I have that last value. But if a value was to appear later on, I then have that value. So it's always grabbing the last value from row 10, which in this example is the current month sales. So that's a really useful example. Very common question to get last row, last column of an Excel table. And it's also a demonstration also of R1C1 references. Another key benefit of the indirect function. How can I do examples of the indirect function without incorporating a VLOOKUP example? I don't think that would be fair now. So what I've got is those three tables again, which will hopefully look familiar. Southampton, Liverpool, Cardiff, salespeople. This time, I want to extract a particular salesperson sales from a particular region. And these have been displayed as separate tables. So in the top left, I'm currently searching for Jessica's value in the table called Southampton. And I want to return a sales figure, which should come out at 838 for Jessica. Now if I just zoom in on this uh, sheet for one moment, and we're going to put a VLOOKUP in cell B3. So the lookup value is Jessica, B1. The table array is going to be the region in there. Now I can't just click on B2, and I'm going to demonstrate that I can't do that by doing it wrong to begin with. Comma, column index number, it's the second column of each table. Comma, false, it's an exact match. Now Excel is going to moan about that, because I can't just refer to Texas in a cell. That is a reference. I need indirect. So if I put the indirect function in and then reference B2, it will be quite happy for that to work. Now, once again, these three tables have been named. This is using a named range. If I click on my drop down list and you'll see a few others in here from this workbook at this moment, but Liverpool, Southampton and Cardiff are in there. If I choose Cardiff, it knows it's that table. Liverpool is that table and Southampton is that table. So it's using the value of a cell as a reference to one of those ranges. If I change Southampton to Cardiff, I now find Jessica's value from the Cardiff table, the 933. So that's an example of indirect being used with a VLOOKUP function to create a conditional table array. Okay, the fifth and final example of indirect. This example uses indirect to create dependent drop down lists. This is one of my most popular videos on my YouTube channel. 
and I'm going to incorporate this as a, another example of indirect in this video. So what I've got here is a list of countries and then within each country I have different regions. Now let's imagine that's one of my shops, one of my stores. What I want to do in cell F2 of this spreadsheet is have a drop down list to choose a country, Canada, Germany or UK. And when I do that, oh sorry, an office I've got here, but in cell G2, I will have a drop down list of the regions, the offices in that country. So if I choose Germany, I should only have a list with those four. If I choose UK, it should be a list of those five, etc, etc. So that drop down list is dependent on the previous one. Now, once again, these ranges are named. If I highlight those three cells, it's called countries. If I highlight those two, it's Canada. Highlight those four, it's Germany. Highlight those five, it's UK. They have been named in advance, name ranges. Cell F2, data validation, data tab, data validation. From my allow option, I'm going to choose list. And for the source of the list, I will type equals countries, which is the named range for cells A2 to A4. So Canada, Germany, UK, when I click OK, I get a drop down list of Canada, Germany, UK, because that is the range called countries. What I need now is when somebody chooses the UK, for example, I need these five offices appearing in this drop down list. So back to data validation for cell G2. Choosing a list and from the source equals, but I can't just say equals F2, whatever F2 says. I have a named range called UK. I have a named range called Germany. So I want to convert whatever string is in that cell to a reference of the same name. So indirect, opening bracket, F2. Because that's the cell that's got UK written in it right now. That's the other drop down list it's dependent on. Close bracket, click OK. Don't worry if you get a warning message at that point in your examples. If this cell's blank at the moment, I would have been warned about a possible error. But if I've got a drop down list now, I've got those five places. And if I change the UK to Canada, I only have a drop down list of the two. And if I change it to Germany, I only have a drop down list of the four. And I can select Stuttgart from the list, for example. And I have myself a second dependent drop down list thanks to the indirect function. A truly remarkable function of Excel. One of its lookup functions it doesn't have the popularity of VLOOKUP or maybe index, but it certainly has its place and its benefits, which is what this video was trying to demonstrate with five different examples. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. Please check out some of our other videos on our YouTube channel and come check us out at computergargard.com.